For number 11, part A, we're determining the critical value for a right-tailed test of the population mean. And it gives us the alpha level of significance, and it says there's going to be 20 degrees of freedom. So let's jump into Excel. Here's the information for part A. It's a right-tailed test, 20 degrees of freedom. Here's the formula you would use. Put in your alpha and your degrees of freedom. Now, Excel always gives you the result for a left-tailed test. But in a right-tailed result, the critical value would be the same value just with the other sign. So your answer for part A would be with the positive value of what Excel gave you. For part B, note what alpha is. And B doesn't give you the degrees of freedom. It actually said there was a sample size of 10. So when you're finding the degrees of freedom, take one less than the sample size. So that's where I get 9 from, and again, Excel will calculate it. This time, the answer we get back is what we want because we're doing a left-tailed test. And for part C, we're doing a two-tailed test. It gives us alpha. It told us the sample size was 11, so we're going to have 10 degrees of freedom. And so switch up the formula a little bit in Excel. If you put this 2T on the end, it does the two-tailed test for you. And so just type it in, and here would be your result. And for a two-tailed test, you'll want to have two critical values, the negative and the positive of what you get back. So that's why you have the plus or minus for part C. For number 12, our null hypothesis is that the population mean is 100, and our alternative hypothesis is that it is not equal to 100. We have a simple random sample of size 23, but this is taken from a population that is known to be normally distributed, which is important because our sample size isn't that large. All right, so here's the information about our sample. And we got the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. And we're going to find the test statistic. So with all that information, if you go to page 497 in the textbook, you can see how to find the test statistic. And here's the formula we're going to be using. And so I have all that typed into Excel with the information, and that's what you get. So the critical values for this problem are based off of our level of significance, which alpha here is 0.01. And so we have 22 degrees of freedom because our sample size is 23. Alpha is 0.01 and Excel will give you critical values. And since our alternative hypothesis was not equal, we're actually testing that it could be bigger or smaller. So there's two critical values, the negative and the positive. And our picture looks like this, where we're testing to see whether uh, the data from our sample produced a test statistic that is way out here in one of the tails. And what we have was a value that's less than our critical values. So it's not out there in the tails, it's somewhere in between, which as a result means there's not sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. For number 13, our null hypothesis is that the population mean is equal to 20, and our alternative hypothesis is that it's less than 20. Our sample size is small, but it is obtained from a population that is known to be normally distributed. So we can go ahead with our normal procedure, even though our sample size is relatively small. Here is the information about our sample, and we are going to compute the test statistic first. Again, the formula for the test statistic is on page 497 in the textbook, and you're going to plug in the information about your sample into the formula, and Excel gives you the test statistic value. And the next part of the problem is just to visualize what we're doing here. And a left tail test, we're trying to see if our test statistic is way out in the left tail end of the t-distribution. That's what we do for a less than alternative hypothesis. 
And if the test statistic was way out there, we would reject the null hypothesis. And using the p-value approach, we need to find the p-value for our given test statistic. So just plug it into the t-distribution formula in Excel. We only have 18 degrees of freedom because our sample size was 19. And here's what you calculate your p-value to, to be. And select the correct range where your p-value falls. And then the last part of the question is if the researcher decides to test this hypothesis at the alpha equals 0.05 level of significance, will they reject the null hypothesis? And for this problem that I just went through, the researcher will reject the null hypothesis since our p-value is less than alpha of 0.05. For number 14, we have that the mean age of an inmate on death row was 43.5. So that's our null hypothesis. And we're testing whether that has changed at all. So we're, our alternative hypothesis is that the mean value is not equal to 43.5. And we have a random sample of 34 death row inmates. And here's the information about the sample. And we're going to test our null hypothesis using a confidence interval, a 99% confidence interval. So to construct that confidence interval, you can refer to page 445 in the textbook for the confidence interval formula, page 445. And so you need your critical value, your critical t value, and then you multiply by the sample standard deviation and divide by the square root of your sample size. And you subtract that from your sample mean and also add it to your sample mean to get your lower and your upper bound. So that's what I'm doing here. And you can use this formula in Excel. We need a two-tailed test because our alternative hypothesis was simply not equal to. So it could be either bigger or smaller, so two tails. And 99% confidence means there's just 1% in the tails. And we have 33 degrees of freedom based off of our sample size being 34. Then here's our critical T value we'll need. So plug that into the formula that we saw on page 445 along with the information from your sample. And you'll get this estimation error. And then subtract that from your sample mean to get the lower bound. Add it to your sample mean to get the upper bound, and there are the lower and upper bound of your confidence interval. And since our null hypothesis is safely in between the lower and upper bound, it is inside the confidence interval, we will not reject the null hypothesis. For number 15, our null hypothesis is that the mean temperature of humans is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're going to use our alternative hypothesis that the mean temperature of humans is less than 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So a left tail test. And so we're measuring the temperatures of 148 adults, but we're doing it several times a day for three days. So our sample size is actually 700 measurements. And then here's the information about our sample data. The mean temperature came out to 98.3 degrees Fahrenheit with a standard deviation of 0.7. So we're going to test our null hypothesis using the classical approach and the p-value approach. And our level of significance is 0.01. And so jumping into Excel here, our sample mean came out just slightly below the null hypothesis. And so we need to use our techniques here to see if it's significantly enough below that we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And page 497 of the textbook tells you how to calculate the test statistic. And so plug in all the information, calculate the test statistic. And now we're going to calculate the critical T value for 99%. So that's 0.01. Uh, that would be in the tail. So we enter that in the formula and our degrees of freedom is 699 because our sample size is 700. And so here's what we get for our critical t-value. So the classical approach, negative 11 
It's farther to the left than negative 2.33, so we're going to reject our null hypothesis. And with the p-value, we use our t-distribution, plug in our test statistic, degrees of freedom, and we get this back, which Excel's giving me this in scientific notation. So the e negative 28 means we need 10 to the exponent negative 28. Or in other words, shift this decimal 28 spots to the left. So there's a ton of zeros. There would be 27 zeros in the decimal and before we saw these numbers show up. So it's a very, very small chance of getting this kind of test statistic if our null hypothesis was true. So we would, uh, using the p-value test, we also reject the null hypothesis. And since we just enter four decimal places for a part B in the answer, it's just going to be all zeros. And so to wrap up number 15, I just wanted to mention that it may have appeared that our sample mean was pretty close to the null hypothesis and it didn't seem likely we were going to reject it. And it's only 0.3 off. But 0.3 actually was pretty significant because our sample size is so large. And with a sample size this large, if this null hypothesis was true, we should have been much closer to 98.6 uh, than we were. So that's why we're getting a test statistic that's so far off to the left and why we're going to reject this null hypothesis. Uh, we should have been closer with a sample size this large. To, to further illustrate that, look what happens when you change your sample size Let's say, how about 50? If I change my sample size to 50 instead of 700, my test statistic is only negative 3 now instead of negative 11. Um, so still would reject because it's um, outside the critical value, but it's much closer now. If you drop down even farther, let's say to 30, now we're right really close to the reject mark. Um, and an even smaller sample size, let's say 20, we would end up not rejecting the null hypothesis.